hello everybody and welcome back to the class the third class and uh, basically what we discussed in the last class is uh, distribution of the end to end vector uh, of a polymer chain of an ideal polymer chain which is uh, doing a random walk in 3d and an idea of the extent or the spread of the chain i mean size of the chain was given by the uh, end to end distance statistically average or uh, end to end distance squared which is statistically averaged and you, then you take the square root of it so what we want to discuss today is uh, basically uh, describe more the properties of the extent of the polymer chain when it is uh, we remove some of the approximations of an ideal polymer chain or a freely jointed chain and so on and so forth okay but uh, before that so let's start uh, with some numbers so that you have a clear idea about how a polymer chain dilute polymer chain a solution uh, is spread in a solution so just to have an idea of the numbers a uh, monomer typically would be a size of 5 angstrom or for ease of calculation just take it to be 1 nanometer which is basically the bond length uh, between one monomer and the next right and if the size of a polymer is 1 nanometer just take that to be the suppose the radius and then the monomer volume would be r cube the radius cube of a monomer which is 10 to the power 27 uh, minus 27 meter cube now if you are talking about a st completely stretched polymer chain so you take a polymer chain and completely stretch it so then the r max or the end to end distance of the polymer chain when it is completely extended uh, the extent would for a 10000 monomer chain Uh, would be basically 10 to the power four into b, which is 10 to the power minus five. On the other hand, the complete stretched extent of a polymer chain with 10 to the power six monomers would be 10 to the power six, right, into b one nanometer, and that would be 10 to the power minus three meters. But when it is in solution, a polymer chain is not completely stretched. and so an estimate of the size the mean size of the polymer chain an estimate uh, from the which you can do from the end to end distance uh, would be square root of the statistical average of the end to end vector rn square which is basically ree the extent of a polymer chain and that would go as n to the power half into b and if you have 10 to the power 6 monomers then uh, n to the power half is 10 to the power 3 and into b which is 1 uh, nanometer and you get 1 micron so what is the picture the picture is suppose a polymer chain at time t1 is in this configuration such that the n to n distance is the distance between this point and this point but at time t2 it is in a different conformation so that the end to end distance is more suppose here from here to here and at some other time t3 this is the polymer configuration so the end to end distance is relatively low so you can calculate the distance and uh, by calculating this quantity ree draw a circle or a sphere um, uh, basically about Uh, it uh, so basically an r cube which will give an end an estimate of the volume uh, over which the polymer chain is uh, exploring right and that is vp and that is vp the average volume uh, it's a statistically average quantity because you are using ree to calculate it and that is ree cube and that is 10 to the power minus 18 meter cube right because ree was 1 micron so basically volume is uh, 10 to the power minus 18 notice we are uh, ignoring the prefactors uh, because we just need an estimate on the other hand the volume of 10 to the power 6 monomers right uh, which we denote by vm 
uh, is basically 10 to the power minus 27 into 10 to the power 6 and that is 10 to the power minus 21. So the volume of all the monomers divided by the average volume of the polymer chain which is called the pervaded volume and you divide the two and that is 10 to the power minus 3. That means if you take uh, this green uh, line, which is the an estimate of the pervaded volume calculated from REE cube, then uh, the monomers actually occupy only one by thousand of the volume, which is which the entire chain basically occupies. So most of the polymer is solvent inside this pervaded uh, volume. Uh, putting it um, uh, not in individual numbers, but in more generic uh, power law forms. So for a Gaussian chain, so for a Gaussian chain, uh, as you know, REE goes as B into N to the power, of, where N is the total number of monomers in a chain. And this is also called the freely jointed chain. And then the pervaded volume, which we just discussed, VP, the volume spanned by a polymer chain uh, basically is given by REE cube. And then since RE goes as n to the power half, the vo pervaded volume goes as n to the power 3 by 2. On the other hand, the mass of a polymer chain is uh, basically the mass of a monomer into the number of monomers, right? And that is basically, this is the mass of a polymer chain. And then the local density of monomers in pervaded volume goes as m into n upon b cube into n to the power 3 by 2 from here. And that is goes as 1 by root 10. What is the message? The message is, or the consequence is, that as the length of the chain increases, the density of monomers within the pervaded volume decreases. The density decreases as 1 by root n. So the larger the chain within the volume explode by the polymer chain, the more dilute is the monomer concentration, the local density of monomers within the volume, within the pervaded volume. So most of the volume within a polymer chain, or the pervaded volume of a polymer chain, is filled with solvent and is devoid of monomers. And this is the case for dilute polymer solutions, right? We're not talking metals, just to clarify. Now, since the polymer, uh, so in the polymer solution, uh, most of it is a solution and very less of monomers, uh, it is better uh, to help you to read the literature, to have clear idea of what you mean by concentration, what you mean by density of polymer, so that when you read it, uh, any paper, you exactly know what it means. And we shall also introduce some new ideas called the overlap concentration and so on and so forth. So the concentration of, uh, so when, you, when a paper talks about the concentration of a polymer solution, what it is saying is basically, and it's a dilute system, so you have a huge amount of solvent and within which some polymer molecules are floating around and they're not interacting with each other. So that's what the dilute polymer solution is. And in that case, the concentration of polymers is NP, which is the number of polymers contained uh, in a volume L cube, which is filled with solvent, and into N, where N is the number of uh, monomers in a chain. So this is basically, when you say concentration, it is basically the number of monomers in the entire solvent by the volume of the box in which the solvent is uh, contained. But the density of polymers means very different, and you're really talking about a dry polymer, no solvent, and that is the molar mass of, uh, so basically the molar mass of the monomer, and uh, divided by the molar volume. So you could write this as M, which is the mass of a monomer into Avogadro number of uh, monomers, volume of a monomer 
into uh, Avogadro number of uh, monomer. So basically, it is monomer mass by volume of a monomer. Right now, volume of a monomer, of course, is taken to be zero in the Gaussian approximation. But a real polymer chain, uh, of course, it, there is a finite volume to each monomer. Okay. Now uh, you have the concentration here, but if you multiply this concentration by the mass, right? Uh, so, which is basically what you do here. So, so you have the concentration, and this into m is what you have as the mass concentration. So, which is denoted by c. So, uh, so what you uh, so c is mass of a polymer or mass of all the polymers, number of polymers into mass of each polymer divided by uh, the volume uh, in which the all the polymer and the solution, the polymer solution is, is the mass concentration. On the other hand, you have a completely separate quantity called the volume fraction, phi. Uh, and that is basically this mass concentration divided by the density and here what I have done is put this expression of C here and the uh, expression for one by rho, which is mass of a monomer divided by volume of a monomer here. And what you have here is NP is number of polymers into N into V mon, which is the volume of all the monomers in a chain. Right. So what is this? Basically, it's the total volume of monomers in the entire solution because there's more num volume of monomers in a chain. This is number of polymers divided by the entire polymer solution. And that is volume fraction. OK. On the other hand, you have the so-called overlap volume fraction. And that is basically the volume of the monomers of a single polymer chain divided by the pervaded volume. So let's see what that is. Now suppose this is your solvent, this is your solution, polymer plus uh, solvent, and this is your polymer chain, and it is of course taking various configurations, and then you can have an estimate of the mean end-to-end -end distance, and then you can have a pervaded volume which is denoted by this blue line here, and or this blue uh, dotted line here, right? And that is an estimate of the pervaded volume. So what you have overlap volume fraction is that the volume of all the monomers in this chain, or a particular chain, divided by the mean pervaded volume, right? And that is the overlap volume fraction. Uh, just to summarize, because we put, uh, we, I threw at you a lot of different terms. Let's discuss, just summarize what is volume fraction, what is concentration, what is density, what is overlap volume fraction, and so on and so forth. So just to uh, just remind you, C is number of monomers. This is the number of monomers in a chain into number of polymers by the total uh, volume of the solution, L cube. And if you multiply it by M, which is the mass of a monomer, you get the mass concentration. And uh, the phi, the uh, volume fraction is C by rho. And this is basically the volume of all the monomers divided by the volume, uh, by the solvent uh, solution volume, which is L cube. On the other hand, C star, or which is the overlap concentration, is essentially and the mass of a polymer, of a single polymer chain, M is the mass of a monomer into number of monomers in the chain, divided by the pervaded volume. And this quantity you can show the, by writing suitable terms, right? Uh, that this is nothing but C star. C star is this overlap concentration is equal to rho into the overlap volume fraction, which is very similar to this. So phi is replaced by phi star, C is replaced by C star, and rho remains intact, where phi star is basically the volume of the monomers of a single polymer chain 
divided by the pervaded volume right now if phi the volume fraction becomes equal to the overlap volume uh, fraction phi star that is the condition of overlap of polymer chains so what i do in the next step is write down the expression for phi and write down the expression for phi star and when they are equal that is the condition for overlap and now if you cancel n from both sides of the equation and vmon from both sides of the equation what you get is np number of polymers into the pervaded volume equal to l cube which is at the condition for overlap what does it mean it means that suppose this is your entire polymer solution box where you have both polymers in the solution and then uh, basically here it is uh, this is the pervaded uh, volume of a single polymer chain this is the pervaded volume of a single poly another polymer chain just they are identical but i've shown them in different colors so that one can see identify each other and this is the pervaded volume of another polymer chain and what i'm saying is number of polymer chain into the volume into the pervaded volume essentially occupies the entire volume of the polymer solution and if phi the volume fraction is greater than the overlap volume fraction then you call it to be a semi dilute solution right previously i had shown it pictorially but now i'm just giving it a quantitative meaning uh, then the pervaded volume is occupied by more than one uh, by monomers of more than one polymer so this should not be uh, monomer but it's occupied by monomers of more than one polymer what does that mean suppose this blue uh, suppose this blue uh, chain uh, has a pervaded volume of this size you see that within it there is also the red polymer and the pervaded volume of this red polymer would be something of this size within which you both have both the green polymer chain and the blue polymer chain right so this is the condition or this is the criteria when phi is greater than phi star or all the entire volume is occupied by the pervaded volume of individual poly, uh, polymer chains then the polymer chains are just touching each other right and that is the condition for overlap so now let's change tack and switch to a slightly different topic so now uh, let's talk about some corrections uh, to the ideal uh, polymer chain um, so we still ignore excluded uh, volume as of now so that's why they are still ideal but in the freely jointed model uh, suppose this was monomer number 1 2 3 4 and so on where this was the bond length so th this bond vector and this bond vector could take any orientation with respect to each other and similarly the second bond vector could uh, uh, be oriented in any direction with respect to the third bond vector and so on so forth but uh, you would know that in reality all angles are absolutely not possible because there would be constraints uh, determined by the chemistry so that basically uh, the neighboring bond vector would have uh, preferences to have a certain angle with respect to the previous one and uh, there should could also be uh, constraints on the uh, torsion angle uh, across uh, between the neighboring bond vectors right now uh, okay so at the moment let's uh, ignore uh, torsion but just suppose uh, that all angles between neighboring bond vectors are not allowed and there are certain preference of an angle cos theta between a particular bond vector and its neighboring uh, bond vector now suppose uh, uh, between this and this the next one a certain angle of theta is allowed but within that theta uh, it can rotate around like this so basically all angles as long as this angle theta is maintained is uh, allowed so there's no constraint on the third uh, like phi 
right? So what would be the consequence? So so, uh, so this polymer chain where all angles were allowed would now, so this is the first bond uh, uh, vector and this is the next one which would be at an angle theta with this bond vector and the third bond vector would be at an angle theta with respect to this uh, bond vector, all angles, so this cannot stretch, it cannot take any angle. As a consequence, this polymer chain locally will be uh, more extended, so locally more extended because only certain values of uh, theta are allowed and it cannot simply do this or this or this, right? So which would be the case of a freely jointed chain, right? So basically there would be constraints by some chemistry. And we are saying that let there be small n uh, monomers. So it's intentional that instead of capital N, I'm using for this discussion, small n. So these are real uh, monomers given by constraints of suppose the chemistry and L is the bond length and then REE -E, just as before would be Rn square equal to L bond length into n to the power half for a ideal Gaussian chain the perfectly freely jointed chain but in this case when there is some constraints uh, the end-to-end -end distance is locally more extended. The consequence, even the end-to-end -end distance of the entire chain uh, will be uh, some number. So instead of one, some is, is still NL square, but it is some number which is greater than one. And it's often seen that uh, in for many polymers, it is uh, between five to eight. Of course, for the DNA, it is much higher. But for most polymers, it is around 5 to 8. So basically, REE -E is not proportional to NL square anymore, but some number much greater than 1. And that is called the Flory characteristic ratio, right? Which is typically uh, between 5 and 8. OK. So now, now so then is, is this freely jointed model at all valid? Well, it can be made valid if we redefine what we call the monomers and uh, re and describe a freely jointed chain, not on terms of real monomers of the polymer chain, which is N, but in terms of Kuhn monomers. So what? So this is KUHN, Kuhn monomers. Okay, and often polymer faces are more uh, can, uh, are more happy uh, to talk about Kuhn monomers, and let's see what that is. And so basically, what we have is REE, -E, the end-to-end -end distance. Of course, this is statistically average quantity, and that is some number greater than one. The Flory characteristic ratio into n to the power half, where n is the number of monomers in a real polymer chain, real means I mean, uh, with theta constraints, n to the power half into L, which is the bond vector. Now, I'm saying, can we write uh, in terms of some effective description such that REE -E square, which is the same as this, I'm just done a square, is nk into bk square, right? So basically it's just taking the whole uh, whole square of this, but dropping c infinity. So is there, can we write the uh, this REE -E in the form of a freely jointed chain model where of course the number of uh, monomers uh, instead of n, it is the number of Kuhn monomers and instead of L, it is the Kuhn segment. So then, so there's an effective description where the freely jointed chain is valid, but not in terms of the original monomers of the chain, but in terms of, but in terms of Kuhn number of monomers and the Kuhn segment, okay? So how do we get NK in terms of the original polymer chain and in terms of values of the original polymer chain. And then we can talk about 
Kun monomers and Kun segments and freely jointed chain and so on and so forth again. So to do that, uh, note that R max that suppose the polymer chain in a completely stressed condition is n, it is this n into L, the real bond length into cos theta by two, where I have said that suppose this uh, these subsequent bond vectors are all uh, at an angle theta. And then if you calculate the distance between this point and this point, and that is equal to R max, then basically what you want is this, this, uh, what, uh, this distance, and that will be cos theta by two from the diagram you can figure out. And then again, so this is theta. So this distance, will be L cos theta by two again. Again, this distance will be L cos theta by two. And if you have N bonds, then R max uh, in the completely stressed condition as allowed by cos theta two will be NL cos theta by two. And this again, we write in terms of the number of Kuhn monomers into, into the Kuhn bond length, right? Instead of NL, we have in introduced a cos theta by two, but this is the Kuhn bond length, just uh, like we would have done for a freely jointed chain, right? So N K is the number of Kuhn monomers, B K is the length or size, uh, length of a Kuhn monomer or the bond length between two Kuhn monomers. Then we can write R E E square equal to nbk squared, which is the same formula as this. But now nk into bk, nk into bk, we are substituting by r max here into bk, right? And just to remind you that ree was basically, or ree squared uh, was, I think this formula is wrong. This is the correct. So R E E square is the infinity N L square. So here I should have written a square root here, right? But when you will take the whole square, then this is right, C infinity N L square. Okay, so if you have this relationship, then we can write uh, BK, right? So basically BK is R E E square by R max, right? So basically you're getting uh, the, the an idea of the Kuhn segment as N to N vector square by R max, uh, so which is this is a statistically average quantity. And here you're replacing BK so here you are replacing BK by R max into NK, right? So then you get NK equal to R max square by R E E square because you will basically uh, replace. Uh, so basically you do this substitution and R max uh, you replace here and then you can get this. Right, and uh, remember both is of dimension length. So this is the maximum extent squared. This is an average quantity. And if you get this, then you get an idea of the number of Kuhn monomers. So basically what you have is a real polymer chain of N monomers is replaced by an ideal polymer chain of NK monomers. So this is the Kuhn monomers and basically we, we the n that we were talking about in the freely jointed chain model is basically then uh, the number of kuhn monomers right now ree -E can be measured by scattering and so on and so forth and if we know what is the total r max we can find out what is the number of kuhn monomers in the segment and we can calculate this quantity and this quantity in terms of these two quantities, right? So what do we have? So what we have is this was your original polymer chain. And now suppose 
this segment or sorry one two three four approximately four monomers are replaced by one kuhn monomer and correspondingly you had uh, this segment where basically uh, subsequent bond vectors have to maintain a certain angle with re uh, with respect to each other though it could rotate uh, about uh, its uh, axis so that has been replaced by this bond vector uh, right and then suppose uh, 4 5 6 7 8 that has been replaced by this bond vector so you have the eighth monomer here somewhere. So basically an estimate in this direction. Then this uh, this bond vector, bond vectors be between eight and nine, and nine and ten, eleven and twelve has been replaced by this bond vector, and so on and so forth. So, and the Kuhn uh, monomers or the Kuhn bond vectors can take any angle with respect to each other. So now if you have a real polymer chain and you replace it and you can figure out what is the length of the Kuhn segment and how many monomers are there in the Kuhn segment, right? And small n polymer number of monomers are replaced by nk, well, capital N number of Kuhn monomers. Then we can keep discussing about the polymer chain independent of whatever is the monomer constituent. If you have different monomer constituents, then the NK values and the BK values will be different. But if you have a long polymer chain, you are good in terms of describing the polymer statistics or the polymer physics in terms of Kuhn monomers. However, if you are looking at length scales smaller than the Kuhn monomers, right? Or suppose the, 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 the length of the total length of the polymer chain is just a few times the Kuhn monomer, you need to incorporate semi-flexibility, which means a finite bending energy cost uh, to describe the polymer physics. Okay, so what I've done next is just to get, again, give you an idea of the numbers because in soft matter, basically theory and experiments goes very close hand in hand with each other. So uh, so in on page number 53 of Rubinstein and uh, Colby, there's a table of 2.1 and they have listed 10 very, uh, common polymers with such big uh, monomer names, the big chemical names. So I I think uh, for this class, I will avoid uh, spelling out those difficult chemical names. But what is the message? It shows that for those list of common 10 uh, monomers, uh, polymers made up of those particular monomers, this is polyethylene and polybutylene and so on and so forth. Uh, the C infinity typically ranges from 4.7 to 9.5. Uh, the Kuhn segment, the Kuhn segment B on the BK, the length, uh, the Kuhn monomer, the Kuhn bond vector is typically 8.4 to 18 angstroms, right? And uh, basically the density of polymer chain is basically very similar to that of uh, water. It varies of, for those uh, 10 uh, polymers which have been listed, the density varies from 0 0.8 to 1.1 grams per cc, right? And you know the density of water is 1 gram per cc. On the other hand, the molar mass of the Kuhn monomer, right? the Kuhn, which is a basically a collection of, uh, well, it's basically a coarse grained uh, effective description of a large number of monomers within which there is some flexibility. Uh, that molar mass is uh, basically varies for these different 10 uh, polymers from 100 to 800 grams per mole. For water, you know it is 18 grams per mole. So these Kuhn monomers are much more massive than individual single monomers of the real polymer chain. And once you have a description of the Kuhn polymer you do your uh, polymer physics instead of looking at the details of the chemistry of the monomers right to so just to solve a problem which is already done in rubinstein and uh, colby so for so the question is to find out the kuhn length 
bk is the cool length uh, of a polythene chain for which it is given that uh, the flory characteristic ratio is 7.4 the main polymer the main chain bond length the actual uh, you know small l be between re real uh, monomers is 1.4 angstrom and when we discussed the estimate we took it as 1 nanometer but it's more like 1.54 angstrom and the bond angle between consecutive bond vectors is 68 degree so then the kuhn segment the kuhn length can be figured out by ree square by r max and ree square can be written as c infinity into n the total number of monomers in the chain into l square this is the bond length l square the real bond length and r max is n l cos theta by 2 as you can see in the previous slides and then n and n cancels what you have c infinity into l by cos theta by 2 and if you put in the numbers the kuhn segment or the kuhn length of a polymer chain comes out to be 14 angstroms right okay uh, so now so that's so when you are describing your polymer chain and it's long enough so that you can describe it in terms of n or in k kuhn segments that's uh, fantastic but you know uh, uh, one also at times especially when you're talking about things like dna uh, the kuhn segment there is around 100 nanometers and if you are looking at the physics of the DNA segment at length scales of less than 100 nanometers, you need to consider the so-called ideal se uh, semi-flexible chain. And the various models are the freely rotating chain about which we have already uh, talked a bit uh, about it. Uh, and this is in contrast to the freely jointed model where all angles are allowed this is called fjc and this is called frc freely rotating chain right and from the uh, freely jointed chain model one can go to the gaussian chain model which is the continuum limit of the fjc and uh, in contrast these are flexible chains and this is still ideal why ideal because excluded volume is still uh, neglected and later we shall include the effect of excluded volume but not in this class so and this is ideal semi-flexible chains so from the freely rotating chain where uh, adjacent bond vectors maintain an angle of theta with respect to each other you have also you also hear about the craft keep Porode model, which is basically the freely rotating chain model, where you have an extremely small value of the theta between consequent bond vectors. And when you go to the continuous limit of the Stratky Porod model, it is called the worm like chain model. So basically, whether you are whether, uh, you are reading a simulations paper which will talk about the freely rotating chain model or maybe the uh, FJC model. I often work with basically Kuhn, uh, Kuhn monomer uh, with excluded volume interactions, but that's a side story. But, um, so if you're reading a simulation paper, you will be talking about the freely rotating chain model. On the other hand, if you are looking at uh, analytics paper, they'll be talking uh, typically of the worm-like chain uh, model, but the physics is basically the same right uh, here you have discrete bond vectors you here you are talking about the continuum limit of the frc model and you have also the hindered rotation model where there are constraints about the torsion and angle which are allowed okay so now just let's introduce the idea of a persistence length for a semi flexible polymer chain so the persistence length of a dna polymer is 50 nanometers which is huge so it's a very stiff polymer chain and for microtubules it's order of millimeters and that is a measure uh, that's a measure of the length scale it's how long the polymer um, uh, you have to go along the contour length before 
uh, the angular correlations. So suppose this is a bond vector. There's a segment and it is pointing in a certain direction. But as you go along the chain and since there are thermal fluctuations, the chain can take different conformations. And over a certain length scale, as you go along the contour, basically you lose the angular correlation. You lose over distances greater than the persistence length or greater than twice the persistence length. Uh, basically, a segment of a polymer chain and another poly uh, segment of another polymer chain separated by distances greater than the persistence uh, length, they can point in any possible direction. Basically, again, the freely jointed uh, model uh, can be used as long as you replace it. So what is the persistence length and how is it measured? And how is persistence length uh, related to the so-called cool length about which we have already discussed? So to discuss that, let's start uh, with again the end-to-end uh, the -end vector square. And then there's a statistical average about it, which can be written as, of course, rn dot vector dot rn dot rn vector. And uh, this is the n to n vector Rn. And that in turn can be written as i equal to 1 to n uh, sum over all bond vectors. And that would give you Rn and sum over all bond vectors, right? Where the i and g are dummy indices. Uh, so, right? And g equal to 1 to n. And this can be written as so this product would give you n squared terms. And this in turn can be written as i equal to 1 to n, j equal to 1 to n, no constraints whatsoever, ri dot rj statistical average, right? And if you were working with a worm-like chain, uh, then instead of ri dot rj, you would be talking about the local tangent vector. This local tangent, so this is suppose a worm-like chain, it's continuous. It's, it's continuously bending. You are basically uh, zoomed out, right? So you're not looking at the individual vectors. But so here, tangent vector, tangent vector. So Ti into Tj. There should be this cap here for a worm-like chain model. And for a freely rotating model, it would be Ri into Rj, expectation value. Right, and this in turn can be written as b square into cos theta ij. i and j are different monomers along the polymer chain, and and this cos theta correlation, the angle between this tangent tangent bond vector or the bond vector r i and r j, that we will can show that it can be written as b to the power j minus i into l, which is basically the contour length. j minus i is the monomer index indices along the contour length. l is the length of each bond vector divided by lp, which is the persistence length, which is saying that this angular correlation, as you go farther and farther apart, this angular correlation decays exponentially. And over the length, uh, over the length scale of LP, the so-called persistence length, basically this correlation is completely lost. So if you are looking at the angular correlations between effective segments much larger than the persistence length, this angular correlation is lost. You can again talk about uh, the so-called uh, that different segments are pointing in all possible random directions with respect to each other. But the Kuhn segment description comes, as you saw in the previous slide, the persistence length is calculated by taking this dot product of the tangent tangent, uh, so, um, the local tangents or the vector or the in FRC, the bond vectors Ri, Rj, and you calculate that as you go along the length, as you increase Ij, 
how does uh, uh, if the this cos theta expectation uh, you fit that with that exponential and you calculate lp from this and how how do you get that i showed it so cos theta ij can be written as as you go along the chain uh, basically all subsequent bond vectors at, are at an angle theta with respect to each other right so as a consequence uh, cos theta ij as you go along will be cos theta into j minus i expectation value right and uh, basically this can be written as this cos theta j minus i can be written as exponential log of so, ex, uh, so we have introduced an exponential as well as a log, the cos theta j minus i, and you say that, okay, this can be written as uh, this j minus i is being brought in front, j minus i into long cos theta, and then you write this j minus uh, this long cos theta, you write it as one upon long cos theta, right, and introduce an L here and an L here both in the numerator and the denominator so that this uh, exponent remains dimensionless. You do a minus sign and a minus sign and LP is whatever is there in the denominator which is L into minus one to ln cos theta. And this is the formula of a persistent uh, length for a FRC, freely rotating chain. Right, and basically, so this is the so I have repeated that LP equal to minus L ln cos theta, right? And that's basically that algebraic manipulation that I did, or cos theta ij can be written consequently as e to the power minus j minus i modulus because it doesn't matter whether i is greater than j or it's less than j whether you go ahead in the chain from a certain uh, monomer or back uh, backward or for, uh, forward it doesn't matter it's basically along the chain contour is what you are considering so i minus j modulus into l by lp so over that length scale you lose the correlations that's the approx uh, that's the that's the idea and i minus j l is s which is the contour length and if you uh, have this if you say that this is decaying exponentially then doing a bit of more of algebra you can show that r n square this should be a n here equal to n l square one plus cos theta into one minus cos theta this the flurry characteristic ratio is this one plus cos theta into one minus cos theta. And as I already told you, C infinity or the uh, flurry characteristic length is often greater than four. Now, when this theta takes relatively small values, then cos theta can be written as one minus theta square by two, which is the kratky porod model or the worm-like chain model. And then ln cos theta, can be written as ln 1 minus theta square by 2. Basically, I'm substituting this here. And that is equal to, it's how you expand ln 1 plus x, and uh, that is minus theta square by 2. Thereby, sp, what was sp? It was basically here, 1 upon ln cos theta, 1 upon ln cos theta minus is 2 by theta square. And then LP, you multiply SP by L, which is basically this formula is 2L by theta square. Okay, so that's, so basically you're using, uh, yeah, you're using the expression of SP and the previous slide to get an estimate of the persistence length. Uh, on the other hand, the infinity, 
which is 1 plus cos theta into 1 minus cos theta can also be written as you are expanding, you are writing cos theta in terms of 1 minus theta square by 2. As a consequence, you get C infinity equal to 4 by theta square. Now, the Kuhn length BK, the Kuhn length BK was written a few slides back. Basically, here. Right, as c infinity l by cos theta by 2, right, and c infinity is 4 by theta square and cos theta uh, by 2, again, uh, you write it by 2, can be written as uh, basically 1 minus theta by, um, by 2 whole square into half. So you can ignore uh, the theta square by 2 theta by 2 whole square into half. And so then you get Kuhn length equal to 2 LP because LP is uh, 2 L by theta square as shown previously. So uh, this Kuhn length BK uh, is proportional to two persistence length. That's a very important result which is often used because if you know the persistence length, if you can measure the persistence length or if you can calculate the persistence length from points that we should soon discuss, uh, then uh, you know the over uh, which length scale or above which length scale uh, you can consider it to be a, a random walk polymer, right? And so you know number of Kuhn monomers and then you can use the statistical mechanics of random walks. Of course, here we are still assuming, remember, uh, that um, you have the ideal chain, excluded volume zero. And of course, in the next two classes, we will also be learning about how to incorporate effects of excluded volume. But that's for another class. And the school length equal to 2 LP, that holds for worm-like chain model. Uh, and the worm-like chain model also, so that's the continuum model and uh, the correspondingly is the freely jointed uh, freely rotating chain model and for the, uh, small values of theta it's called the kratky porod uh, model so for such models this relationship holds the last thing i want to discuss is uh, uh, un under what circumstances under what limiting factors uh, does the freely rotating chain model go to the uh, WLC or the worm-like chain model? And basically, as you are taking the continuum limit, uh, the bond length, so basically you had finite uh, size of the bond lengths in the FRC model. So that bond length uh, goes to zero. And the theta, the angle between go bond goes to zero as well. But in such a manner such that 2L by theta square, so L is going to zero, theta is going to zero, but in such a manner that the persistence length remains fixed, right? You want to have the same persistence length uh, as you go from this model to the other. And furthermore, the R max N into L, that should remain fixed. So in that limit, you can take FRC to the WLC model. Now, depending upon which paper or which kind of problems you are uh, looking at, you, you might uh, find a mention of the FRC model or the, of course, uh, FJC model, the freely jointed chain model. And, but in some papers, they start uh, by doing the statistical mechanics with the WLC model. And I think it's only fair that you at least uh, learn to recognize uh, what are the free energy terms or the what are the terms? How is the WLC uh, model in the continuum limit uh, written as? So for the WLC model, worm-like chain model, the bending energy, the bending energy of a polymer chain is given as K effective by two, where K effective is the flexural rigidity. And we'll come to it in a moment. It's basically the, comes from the bending of uh, beam the uh, bending of beams theory, engineering, uh, uh, or uh, bending of uh, beam physics uh, depends. 
and this is structural rigidity into integration over the entire contour length. So ds is an element of the contour length. So you're integrating over it, and you are basically curvature square. So if there's more curvature, there is more bending, and the elastic corresponding elastic constant is the so-called flexural rigidity, right? And what is curvature? So suppose this is the continuum model. This is a particular path of a polymer chain, a particular conformation of a polymer chain. And at each point, you know, there's a slight bend. So you can calculate the local radius of curvature at each point, at a contour point SI and at a later point and at a contour point SJ. And uh, at each point, you can also have the tangent vector, which is TSI. SI corresponds to a contour segment at position I. Here, this is the radius of curvature at this point at contour point SJ. And this is the corresponding tangent vector, right? And curvature, so the local curvature can be written as one by rad radius of curvature whole square. And what is radius of curvature? That is uh, basically how the contour length changes uh, with the tangent. So it's one by RS whole square. So it's, that's why it's written as dt, the tangent vector ds whole square. And radius of curvature is exactly that. So at each point, how is the tangent vector changing along the length of the contour, right? So the bending energy can be written as k effective by 2 into d tangent vector, unit vector by ds whole square over the contour length of the lattice. OK? And uh, so just to understand what is this uh, bending, uh, what is this bending energy? So suppose this is your entire uh, polymer chain, and you are looking at only a certain segment, ds, and this is your radius of curvature. And uh, from bending of beams theory, which you might have uh, come across in the properties of matter course in the first or second year, basically this bending, uh, so if there's a beam which is being bent, then you have the so-called neutral axis. And uh, basically, so if you're bending like this, the planes, the planes above the neutral axis is extended. The planes below the uh, neutral axis is compressed. And so when I say above and below, it, it is with respect to this point. The, the have a radius of curvature. You are drawing an uh, imaginary circle at each point and calculating the radius of curvature at each point, right? So, uh, so there uh, it can be shown using the physics of bending of beams that E bend equal to half Y, where Y is the Young's modulus into uh, some geometric constant, which is basically called the geometric moment uh, into TS into RS. So it's the local uh, radius of curvature. Right, and then then the um, basically bending energy over the entire beam is half into Young's modulus into this geometric constant uh, into sum of ds over the local curvatures. Right, so basically at each segment you're uh, calculating the radius of curvature, uh, multiplying it by multiplying it by y i and Assume, assumption is that I remains uniform over the length of the chain and uh, summing it over the contour length. Now, I'm not going uh, over to the details of what I is. And I, as I said, is a geometric constant. And basically, from the neutral axis, it's the weighted average, the distance from the neutral axis, z squared into E, it's the area that you are taught, uh, the area of cross section that you are taking. So just for the moment, take it to be a uh, geometric uh, moment, some geometric uh, thing. And this thing is uh, basically discussed well on page 388 of Physical Biology of the uh, Cell. 
uh, and this is basically a physics book giving uh, biology examples and the author is Rob Phillips et al. Okay, so, so this is standard uh, bending of beams theory. Basically here, uh, what sits is yi, Young's modulus, elastic constants into a geometric constant into the local radius of curvature. And as the chain takes different conformations, the value of this uh, RF at each point and consequently uh, the bending energy uh, will be different for different conformations. And this is for a WLC chain, where is this finite bending energy, right? Now, how do you, how do you uh, take the standard bending? So this is a very general uh, uh, formula. And how do you relate it to statistical physics or rather polymer physics, right? Here there was, I mean, we discussed about the polymer chain, but this would be valid for any bent beam. So uh, to realize that, now, you know, in polymer physics, uh, or polymer statistical physics, the primary thing is that the polymer chains are taking various conformations due to and these various conformations of different energies are accessible because uh, it is it has thermal fluctuations. Basically, the polymer chain is taking energy from a heat bath and thereby can access higher energy conformations. Of course, higher energy conformations are less accessible, right? So, but uh, but they are still accessible. I mean, uh, it might be rare. It's uh, so if you have higher energy conformations. Uh, the probability of them being accessed is e to the power exponential e to the power uh, energy of that conformation by kBT. And uh, so, what we want to discuss next is over what length scale does so. So, suppose you have a long polymer chain. It is taking various different conformations, but we're looking at a small segment of the polymer chain. And over what length scale does the energy of bending uh, become comparable to KBT? Because it's so basically the polymer chain or that segment will bend only bend significantly only if uh, that uh, over that length scale, the energy of bending is comparable to KBT. So what we are saying is, okay, uh, when does E bend become comparable to KBT? So instead of E bend, we are saying, okay, its value is equal to KBT. And DS is a small uh, segment of the length of the polymer chain. And uh, this length scale of R is the radius of curvature. So we want to figure out over what length scale uh, does the radius of curvature also become uh, equal to L, okay? And over what length scale, when the radius of curvature becomes equal to L, uh, does the energy of bend become equal to KBT? So hence, we are equating E bend equal to KBT. Here we are keeping only one length scale, the length of the length segment, and we also want to replace Rs, the radius of curvature, by L. So we are saying over what length, so at over what length scale does the radius of curvature become equal to Rs? Uh, our radius of curvature become equal to L, uh, and the energy of bend is equal to KBT. So we are replacing L, Rs, Rs by all equal to L, this cancels. And as a consequence, if you take L uh, to the left-hand side of the equation, KBT on this side, so you call this over this length scale, the bending is significant to lose its correlation because over that length scale, the radius of curvature is equal to L, and you call that the persistence length. So the persistence length becomes K effective by 2 kBT, note, inside the persistence length, you have now a kBT sitting here. So you are comparing, you are using bending energy and putting in thermal fluctuations. You are putting in statistical physics. And K effective, of course, can be written as EI, Young's modulus into I, geometric constant. And so LP equal to EI by 
ABT. So if you have more thermal fluctuations, if you have more uh, if you have more thermal energy, if temperature is higher, uh, basically LP will be smaller. You are going to lose the length scale over which you are going to lose angular correlations. Remember, LP was equal to also mean expectation value of the cos theta, cos theta ij. So as you go away uh, uh, from a segment, as you go farther away, uh, how does cos theta expectation value decay exponentially with the length? And uh, LP was a measure of that. And LP is also related to KBT. So higher thermal fluctuations means lower KBT. Uh, higher, um, higher value of the Young's modulus means a higher KBT, right? So you require more energy to bend. So this is an important uh, relation. And suppose you have a polymer chain and somehow you can experimentally measure the angular correlations, the persistence length, if you know the temperature. Uh, and if you know how the monomers are arranged uh, along the length of the polymer chain, and if you know this geometric constant, you can find out the bending uh, rigidity, the Young's modulus of the polymer chain. On the other hand, uh, suppose you have an uh, atomic force uh, microscopy experiment. So what you can do is take a needle and pull and push a polymer chain at the length scale of nanometers or uh, smaller. And if uh, using your uh, atomic force microscopy experiments, you calculate the bending energy, then you have a measure of the persistence length of the polymer. And then again, you know cool length, and then you know over what length scale you can consider it to be a, um, a random walk polymer, and so on and so forth. Just to complete, uh, the partition function, you, uh, the statistical physics is given by the partition function, and that is given uh, an integral over all, uh, basically, conformations, different tangent vectors as a function of S, so this is the contour length, and dt is the tangent vector. As you take different conformations, uh, you have to basically summing over all microstates, uh, micro conformation paths, right? So you have to sum for each conformation over the tangent vector and all possible microstates. And exponential into LP by 2. So it basically comes from here. You have EI by 2 KBT. Uh, right? So basically, you are writing LP into KBT equal to 2 EI, uh, which is nothing but the flexural rigidity. You are replacing this, the bending energy. And remember, E bend by KBT equal to LP into KBT by 2 KBT. So this KBT in the Boltzmann factor. And that's why KBT, KBT cancels. So E bent by KBT is nothing but this minus LP by two integral over all. Uh, so this is over some over all microstates and this is integral over uh, the path length of a polymer chain for one particular conformation. Right, so this is zero over zero to L over one particular conformation, you are integrating over uh, the path length of a polymer of one conformation, and this is sum over all microstates, and you can calculate the partition function and uh, do your statistical physics. Okay, so the basic message is K effective equal to EI, Young's modulus into a geometric constant equal to KBT LP. Okay, so with this, in this module of the class and I shall add half an hour more for this week in a different recording. Thanks.